in this series where I am programming an NES game live on Twitch from scratch. And uh, tonight we're doing a Friday night stream because uh, yesterday had some things going on that prevented me from uh, doing the stream on my normal Thursday. I'm trying to keep things consistent, but it's hard. Things, things get in the way. Work, life, uh, unexpected interruptions. So, um, apologize for the uh, the stream being a little bit unpredictable, but uh, you know, hopefully. Hopefully you're getting something out of the recordings, and, and as I said in the last stream, I was uh, a little bit unprepared for uh, what we're doing. Um, tonight what I'd like to do and what I'd like to work on is actually spawning our flyby entities as we scroll through the map. Um, we are at a point where we are scrolling, we can collide with the background, um, and that's all controllable through the way that we are building our map and tiled and the asset tool um, making some good progress there with that um, we have our animation functionality working very you know basic animation but it does work when the ship hits something on the map it explodes and uh, the player goes into a death state um, obviously there's more to ha do there we have to have a life count um, and the game over screen and stuff like that but that's all you know we'll we'll go through all of that as we get more and more of this working one thing I did want to cover before I get started on that was um, there were a number of questions that came up over the past week about um, the NES uh, and its uh, ability to access the PPU's memory and uh, the difference between the CPU memory and the PPU memory. So I wanted to go over that a little bit here before we uh, before we get started, because it seems like it's worth uh, covering, so people are uh, can follow that. So if you recall from the very first uh, episode, I talked about how the CPU has a memory map, right? And the memory map has different ranges of locations that have the RAM and then the PPU registers. There's some mirror memory uh, over here and then there's the APU and stuff like that, right? So one thing to keep in mind is that this PPU section here is not the memory of the picture processing unit. It is memory map locations that correspond to addresses uh, sorry, it correspond to registers in the PPU device. So, for example, address 2000 is uh, the PPU control register. So when the CPU is writing a value to that, what it's actually writing to is not memory at location 2000, but instead it's memory that is directly going to the PPU and just like the CPU has the A register and the X register and the Y register and it's got its flags all built into it the PPU has its own registers for controlling how things are drawn on the screen so in this case this is the PPU register for controlling things like um, which uh, memory location the PPU is using for the sprites in the backgrounds, right? Because if we, uh, let's just talk about that concretely here. If we load up the, uh, the game and we open up the PPU viewer here, if you look at the, the character viewer, you can see this is address two, uh, zero and this is address 1000 those are the PPU memory addresses they are different than if I bring up this memory which is also zero um, but ho holds totally different information this is the RAM of the CPU right so this is where all of our work is being done and where all the computations are occurring and the state of the game exists this is a separate address space this these addresses refer to addresses that the PPU has direct access to but the CPU does not. So when it comes to doing things like 
scrolling or updating the memory, what we're doing is we're using address 2005 for scrolling. And we're using two different uh, registers for updating the memory in um, in the PPU. There's address 2006 and address 2007. So you'll recall that there are times where we do a read or a bit operation on address 2002. And the reason we do that is because that operation resets what's called the latch in the PPU. And the, the latch is essentially what controls uh, the order of some of the, the operations that are occurring within the PPU. So for example, when you write to 2005, you're writing to 2005 two times, right? The first write is your X scroll. And the second write is your Y scroll. But because you're not explicitly telling it this, you need some way of ensuring that you're always writing first the X and then the Y. Uh, otherwise, you're going to see weird behavior, right? Because you're providing the wrong scroll for the wrong, uh, the wrong axis. So reading 2002 by using this bit operation uh, resets essentially the internal state of the PPU to expect first the X and then the Y. Now, separately, we have 2006 and 2007, and this one is the PPU address register. And this is the PPU, uh, I think it's called the, the data register. Let's, let's make sure I'm using the consistent terminology with what's on Nestev and Nintendo Age here because I don't want to create any problems uh, where I confuse people. Um, so let's just make sure I'm using the right terminology here. Uh, it's the date, yeah, PPU data register. Okay. So the PPU data register. If I can spell. So bear in mind these addresses again and i'm going to keep emphasizing this because it's really important to hit this point home these are not ram addresses that you're writing to you're not writing to an address 2006 and 2007 in memory what you're actually doing is you're telling the ppu that you are ready to start uh writing data uh, at a particular um into a particular register and again you need to reset the latch for 2006 because it's a two write operation and the reason it's a two write operation is because you need to be able to write the address as a 16 bit value value and there are only eight bit values that can be passed in on this address um, so when you're doing that you're going to do your reset on the latch and then you're going to do whatever your value is for the address. Let's say you want to uh, store something into your palette memory. Again, this 3F00 is not the CPU memory 3F00. This is uh, the PPU memory 3F00, and that is the palette memory. So you're going to first load the first byte of this address into... Um, into the A register and then you're going to store that into 2006 and then you're going to load A with 00, zero and then you're going to store that into 2006 also and what you've done is you've told the the PPU hey the next time I write to 2007, you're going to start at 3F00, right? And we do that in our code here, right? We load the, we do a load A, you can do a bit. It's the same, same process essentially. Um, and then you load A with 3F. You load 
you store it into 2006, then you load a, in this case we're doing 3F02, um, we're loading it with the value 2, we store 2006, and then we load our color that we want to store in there in that location and we do a store into 2007 so you'll often see this followed up immediately with whatever logic you're doing where you're ultimately doing store a into 2007 okay and that store into 2007 is going to actually write into the memory location at 3F, in this case 3F00 in the PPU memory and then depending on how register 2000 is set up um, over here it's either going to increment the the value the pointer into the memory from 3F00 to 3F01 or it'll increment it to 3F20 which increments it by 32 and the reason is because a screen you're either drawing a row like this one tile at a time of 32 tiles or you're updating a column and so you're gonna do 20 updates down the column to update potentially the whole screen across that column uh, but in order to do that because this is just one long contiguous buffer of memory you have to increment to the next position underneath and so that's plus 32 or 20 in hex right um, so hopefully that helps clear things up a little bit I know it looks strange to be doing something like this where you're loading a value and storing it in a location and then you're doing it again immediately following but it's because it's not really a variable it's it's hardware that you're talking to um, so yeah it's it's a it's something you gotta get used to it's not super complicated once you kind of understand that it's not really memory and instead it's it's hardware um, but uh, hopefully that clears it up um, I'm going to refer people to this part of this episode so that they can uh, re-watch this and, and kind of get an understanding of how that all comes together so let's go back to now instantiating enemies in our uh, game so right now in the game you can instantiate those flyby enemies by uh, pressing the B button and they just kind of show up on the screen and you can shoot them and you know if you hit something you blow up um, what I want to do is I want to add the enemy placement more strategically to the actual level and um, have that then get implemented into the game. So the first thing I, I think I want to do is I want to add the flyby just as a essentially a placeholder tile set um, because we're not going to use this as anything for uh, f we're not going to use this tile set definition in the map definition other than to identify the sprite uh, that we are referring to. So, NES asset tool, NES asset tool. I think I got that right, right? Why by TSX. Alright, so. really there we go so it's right there so if we go back to uh, we can close these tile sets because we don't really need them anymore um, there's the flyby let's close that so let's see so I probably want to spawn this uh, let's say like right here on this blue line now the problem with that is that right now we have the tile map set up that it only allows for meta tile placement but uh, tile does support what they call the object layer I'm gonna call this enemies so this is a this is a layer that sits on top of the um, 
the tile layer and allows you to place arbitrary objects. So you can see I can place anywhere. Let's do something like we'll place some, um, so keep in mind, you can only have eight sprites on a particular line at a time and because these enemies are all gonna spawn and move at the same relative speed. Uh, why don't we do something where we, we spawn two here and then we spawn two here and then we spawn two here and we spawn this one in the center. I know it's not perfect, but it doesn't need to be. It's really just to, just to get this to, um, have the, um, have the uh, the objects placed properly, and then let's see how do we move them around. That's that moves the whole object layer. How do I move the object itself? Right, polygon, offset layer. There's no selector. Insert tile. Insert template. That's weird. Um, Oh, select. Okay, yeah. So you can select it and move it around. So let's kind of place it in the middle here. Again, the this is not what the real level is going to look like. We're we're building out the functionality, so it doesn't have to be perfect. I just kind of wanted to be something that is easily recognizable, so we'll know if it worked or not. All right. So now that we have that, let's export this again. And take a look at what this actually generates. Well, see, I updated tiled, and they still haven't fixed the problem with the extension thing. I guess I should submit a bug report. It's really annoying. All right. Yeah, replace that. Okay, so let's take a look at what that looks like. One other thing to mention, I did change the uh, recording or the video output to be 30 frames per second um, instead of 60 to see if that helps with the recording being more consistent. There's still problems uh, where it is dropping video but keeping the audio and I wanted to try and get that out of the way but we'll see if that actually... Um, not out of the way. Uh, I want to see if they can get that to be more consistent, but we'll see. So there is our tile layer, and then this is our enemy object layer. So, I mean, all of this is relatively straightforward. So actually, one question I had was beyond it just using floating point values, um, which I don't care about right now. Is this actually accurate in terms of Y values that are possible in the map? I guess it is because let's see, it's a hundred rows of 32. So up to 3,200. Okay. So that means that the Y value that's here is the Y world coordinate similar to the world coordinate or the same scale as the world coordinate we're using for the ship. So we don't have to do any translation there. So let's first of all make sure that adding this new layer didn't break anything in the asset tool. All right, so it didn't crash, that's good. I didn't think it would. I think I remember specifically looking for the uh, appropriate layers in there. So let's, uh, let's, what is Y by? Hmm.
there's the map. So is it picking up? weird it's got the flyby character and palette but then it's got this thing called flyby are these being exported because of the map change that's what it looks like well let's let's see copy all of this stuff over. Let's make sure that I have a feeling something is going to be broken in the map as a result of this, but let's uh, let's confirm that. Well, that looks that actually looks fine. The map is loading just fine. So, okay. All right, so it's it just must be pulling in some data from the map that uh, not handling exactly right. So let's go back and look at the map data again. Oh, interesting. That must be okay. I know what the I know why that's happening. There must be some sort of logic that's trying to go back <clears throat> looking for the um, the tile set names and then um, as a result it is it, it's assuming that the tile set is in a path like this. And um, it's not, so we're getting we're getting this being cut off. So this should be greater than or equal to zero. <clears throat> Let's make sure that that's right. seems correct to me. I don't see any obvious issues with this here. I mean, we're going to get into a situation where car counter is minus one, but that's okay because the plus one over here will make it zero. Uh, let's just see what this looks like in the watch. Yeah, that looks good. Green tile, bumper, flyby. Yeah, that looks good. Okay, cool. So that's being handled properly now. So now the problem is we are obviously not getting the enemy layer at all because we don't we didn't have it before um, so let's see so this first layer that we're looking at we're getting the type and is it the type of the... All right, so we're checking the type of the file. It's a map. And then we get the tile sets. And then we should be getting the layers next after that. 
So those are the tile sets. And then we're getting the layers. Okay. And then we're getting the data. Well, I guess. I guess we should check to make sure that this is the the actual map layer because if it puts the enemy layer there first it's gonna be no good all right so we got our layers and then let's see Check that the object is an array. Okay, and then we go to the next token. So let's see. So then that is this object. And then get property value, JS code, tokens, token index, tokens minus token index. <clears throat> Type. Oops. Carried my square bracket there along the way. Um, <clears throat> uh, I guess actually it should be get property value a string. And what was I using for my strings? I was using. It's using this here, so I don't have a buffer that I was using for this. Uh, let's call it type buffer max file folder name. And for those of you who have been watching this for a while, I will reiterate, this is, or who haven't been watching for a while, I should say, yes, I realize that this is somewhat messy, somewhat disorganized, and that's fine, because the point is that I am still trying to figure out how all of this is fitting together, and so there will be refactoring done later. This is really just to get the code the data out to the NES in as quick a time as possible and then um, not make you sit through me C programming um, since I'm trying to focus on the NES uh, stuff but you know when we add new things that aren't aren't in the tool uh, obviously we need to uh, we need to be able to uh, do that while we're programming the NES side of it too. Um, all right, so if uh, not string compare uh, type buffer tile layer so we're just going to put all of this in. This is the Logic that handles uh, handle the map tile layer. Um, keep in mind, string compare is similar to some other string comparison functions where it returns zero if the strings match um, so string compare type buffer um, object group this is our enemy object layer it's just 
printf here so we can see that we actually picked that up. Oh, you know, we may not even be iterating through the layers. We may simply be assuming that there is the one and only the one, um, since that was true before, and I didn't particularly care about the other layers. Let's see, check that the object is an array and that there's only a single element for the single name table layer. Oh, uh, no, so this is wrong. Um, Let's just say that it's got to be greater than zero, not nine, zero. And that's really greater, dummy. All right. Uh, so what's going on here? Layers. Where are we at with this? Why is this? coming in here okay okay right so now it's not iterating through the layers that's fine <clears throat> okay Let's tile count is equal to tokens token index dot size do this here because the token index is going to get incremented for um, what indexes have we're using M in here as our generic index. M is less than token index. Some people don't like variables for loops that are just single letters. I don't know. I got used to doing that with C programming using I, J, K. Um, I work with someone who will do, who will use a variable that's like, uh, he'll call this um, the layer index and do a loop like that. I don't know. They're just not that important to me. And then you end up potentially with some wording that is confusing when you have different ind indices that you're iterating through. I don't know. I mean, like token index to me is important because we're using it pretty, pretty heavily and it's not just a generic loop that we're doing. Um, I don't know. Everybody's got their own thing that they do for how all this fits together. This is layer count, not tile count. And uh, some of it is just habit from years and years of programming in C and that being kind of the normal thing. All right, so after we're done with this, how do we iterate past that? I don't remember what the what the appropriate steps are. We need to loop over here. Um, so plus plus token index. So if it's a tile layer, we're gonna go token sub index. Oh, right, because we're getting the property value and that's for data. So we're incre incrementing token index appropriately here. I don't know if that's sufficient. Let's let's look. I don't remember exactly how this was working, just because it, it not being object oriented in this case is a little bit more convoluted than uh, than uh, the procedural implementation. All right, sorry, the procedural implementation is more convoluted than the object oriented version might be. But um, it's not super difficult either. So let's see. This is 
this one has the map width. And this is the map height, which will have 100. And so let's, oh, wait a minute. What's going on with that? Uh, layer count, two, M, zero. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, so now let's see if we get, yeah, it is not, it has not incremented. So num token is minus token index, token index is seven. Token index plus token sub index to increment to the next thing. Check if it's an array. Get the objects. Okay, so token sub index. That jumps us to the next. position for an object, right? And so then that's why we look at the type and we get the map buffer size, which is the array. And then we go to the next token, which is the width. I know these are, sorry, these are all the bytes that can, are contained in the map. And then, right, then we're going back to the, the actual parent object here. So what we need to do is, let's see, I believe there's a way Jasmine object start. So we want to go to the end of that Jasmine object because that is what has, this object is the first object in the array, which is our first layer. Yeah, the previous thing was the array of the two layers. All right, so. At the end here, we want to say token index plus equals tokens token index dot end. Uh, no, not plus equals, just equals. I believe. I don't think it applied that code and change correctly, but let's. Um, we're gonna have to step through it anyway um, and see. Okay. So we load up our map. Where are you? All right, so that's the end value. That's our token, current token index. We're gonna make it that. And so what is this, Jasmine undefined? Oh, that's for the, yeah, that's for Token index minus one, which is not what we want. We want to do that. Hmm. Interesting. So that obviously didn't work. Uh, let's go back for a second here. Um, so tokens, token index is the data object tokens at 2679 undefined at nine it's an array of two oh actually the token index plus nine yeah but those are so those are the primitives start end
Oh, okay. Right. That's the start and the end in the code. That's not the start and the end of the token positioning. Um, crap. So, so that's saying it's got nine things in it. Right, it's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, but it doesn't tell us the size of those things. Um, so let's do this. Let's implement something that will advance the token index based on the the size that's given here. So if we say advance token index. Um, we don't actually care about the code. We're not extracting anything out of it. We're just saying um, um, tokens, token index, and then the actual token index itself. Uh, we'll put this right near here. Advanced token index. And this will take a Jasmine token t and then an end pointer to the token index and so um, what we want to do is we want to say okay Base size is equal to. <clears throat> you know, we could probably do this recursively. And then make it pretty small. I think. So what we would do is we would say, well, let's see. So we'd say tokens, token, token index dot size. So in this case, that would be nine. So we've got nine properties that we want to advance. So then we'd say, You know, I don't think we can do that. Let's see, how would we do this? So we get our first element, which has a size, our second element, element which had would have a size, the third element, which would have a size, a fourth. So we would essentially iterate for i is equal to i less than base size we'd say token index plus one um, token index plus equals or not plus one Token index plus equals token token index size. So we'd iterate nine times incrementing to the next object and then by the size of that object to get to the next object or property or whatever it is, right? I don't know if we need that to actually return anything. All right, so click on that and so the size should be, that's, uh, why is that showing zero? Token 
token index seven tokens token index size is nine okay <coughs> so that's okay that looks like it should be right base size Incremented one too many. Object, and this is was not necessary. All right, that's why that was wrong. All right. So we go to the next object, which is a string. So actually what we need to do is we just need to keep incrementing by size and not by <clears throat> not by that extra one. So the token index at seven. It says the size is nine. Oh, okay, wait a minute. That's the that's why we need that increment by one. It's because we do need that for the first thing we're, we're dealing with, which is the object um, that tells us how many properties we're dealing with in the first place. We don't have to actually do anything for that one um, other than move to the next actual object. All right, so that's our string. That's got a size of one. Then we've got 800. That's got a size of zero. Okay. That's not going to go anywhere. Um, is it property size? I guess we do need to add the plus one every time because it's the object plus its so collective size internally. primitives, which is wrong. And that fails. Okay. <sighs> Let's see. Why? Why would this behave this way? Okay, because when you have an object, so it really depends on the type, I guess. So if it is, if tokens, token index, let's do this. Just so I don't have to keep dereferencing it like this.
Try and be consistent here. So where would this be different? I don't know. Let's let's take a look. So we have it's an object or an array. It's a string. Right, in this case if it's a string, then I think I'm still probably doing this wrong, but let's uh Maybe there isn't any special case. Maybe I'm just... Well, actually, that would be a special case because the size is... You're just incrementing by the size there. So let's see. Instead of the size plus one. And so this is a string now. All right, so now we have our array. So it's this object plus the 800 elements that are coming up and then we're at our next string and then we have a primitive uh, which we need to increment we'll, we'll cheat and increment that in a second String. Why? Why does that string have zero? Oh, is it an empty string? No. What is the string? 2521 to 2533. JSON, JS code 2521. Tile layer one. Oh, so they're both strings. So when we get a st string that has one underneath it, it's it's one of these property names and then the primitive itself. And then if it's a string that has no child objects, then it has a zero length, a zero size. So that size is really just the number of child L the number of <clears throat> what is it it's the number I mean these are properties and then this is an object underneath that it's an array of size 800 this is a string with a primitive another string with a string This should also be size plus one because the su the string with a zero is the actual property itself. All right. Wait, why? This 
is a string. What is the current token index value for start and end are seven, it's 71. So what is the actual string at that location? 71. So that's the data. So that's the property that names it. That is a size of one. So it has one thing underneath it. Data has one thing underneath it, which is the array. So if we get a jasmine, ja, jasmine string type has one thing in it, the size should just be one. And then we get an array and that array has 800 things. Um, so basically, it shouldn't ever get into a situation where it's advancing zero, but if it's a string primitive, that might happen. So let's see here. So it's a string with one thing underneath it. So we go to the next thing and it's the array. And the array has 800 things underneath it. Oh, but you know what? Okay, that's what the problem is. The problem is that I'm assuming it's 800 one byte things or one token things or 800 tokens, but that's not actually necessarily true. So what it should be doing, now this is annoying. Um, all right, so what it should be doing is advance token index, tokens, uh, index, and let's see. So in a case where it's the size is zero, we would advance one to the next object and be done because the base size would be zero and we're done. That's our base case and we return. We just need to say token index is equal to index. In a case where that's not true, we want to iterate over the base size. So however many things there are and so let's go with the case of this is the array coming in it says it has 800 things we'd increment the index by one and then we'd start getting into the actual primitives which have zero so this would just increment keep incrementing the index by one recursively a little bit messy to do it that way, but I think that'll work. And then it'll account for any sort of nesting and subnesting of objects. So let's see. So base size is nine. So we're going to iterate through this nine times. Now, let's see, the base size of this is one. And we've got our array. I'm going to iterate through that. And the base size of that is 800. So we're going to iterate through that. And the base size of that is zero. So we're just going to increment to the next index. And we're going to do that 800 times. So let's, right? Yep. 
So now once we're done iterating through that, we're going to come out here. And we're going to come into here, and we're going to get the size of 0. And then we're going to come back into here. Oh, we're still in the base. Oh, right, because of all the, uh, all right, so we're, what is i's value here? So what I want to do is I want to, uh, I want to break here, condition i equals 7.99. So we, we'll run until we get to that condition. All right. So I is that, and we go to the next one. And now we're at a string. So we pop back out. And we pop back out again. And then we've got another string with a size of one, a uh, base size of one. So, yeah. I think this is working correctly. That index and these values are looking at least close to correct. So now that was an object. Let's take a look at that. So object start at 2691. JSON code, uh, JS code. 2691. That is our layer. Um, but we are done with that. So we are now at the point where, yeah, that that's okay. That's cool. And then we get the property value of string and type buffer is object group. Awesome. That is all right, so that took care of it. That was a little bit messier than I thought it was going to be with the recursion. Um, I didn't think we'd have to do that, but you really do in order to properly handle. Oops, I made that completely full screen. You really do in order to handle, um, like I said, any any nesting of the JSON content uh, that's in here because you know you could imagine that this might be some sort of object with further complex data and really what we want to do is we want to increment our current object position from here to here in the array to get our enemy list um, and that will serve us well for this as well because now we will be able to get our objects property with the appropriate index and then iterate from the next from one object to the next so let's do that um, all right so we have our enemy object layer we want to Increment to the next token index, and that should be an array. So let's make sure that we're not <clears throat> hitting that condition. We are hitting that condition. What is the next string? Oh, right, because it's the object. It's not. Um, it's the object. It's not the. Okay. That's fine. Um, I'm checking that a little too early on. So I want to get the property value for. Same thing. I want to get the property value for now. In this case, objects. So. JS code tokens token index um, num tokens minus token index was that objects 
and then sub token. Wait, is that what I called it? Oh, I never. It's not globally defined there. In sub token index equals zero. Sub token index map buffer size is zero. Return false. Okay. So now this should be the array. Uh, actually, it should be sub token index. Because we should get the array of objects. And it's not. It is an object. Oh, right. It is an object which has. Wait, is that right? Token index plus one that has a string. Eh. This code start zero sub token index. Did it? Mm, well, it should have returned a problem if it didn't find it. If not, get property value. That's weird. Tokens, token, index. Or should I not? I didn't advance enough into this. Um, address of JS code 2704. Draw order. I didn't find it. Why didn't it find it? Because I meant to. I'm not at the object, I'm at the string. So I'm too far advanced into the array of tokens. Is that what is that what I'm seeing here? So let's see now what we got here. Sub token index, token index. That uh, twenty six sixty seven. That's a zero. That's the zero zero new line. So this is the zero from here. I am confused by this, obviously. So token index plus one, I subtracted it. Oh, so it, should I just not do anything to it? It was already at the right position coming through. That's, that would make sense why it's then doing that. Uh, now it's not even getting that far. So, tokens, token index. It's a Jasmine object. 2691. That is the object. And then I want to get the object property sub token index. I got a value. Oh, I'm just not, uh, I'm not using the condition check properly. My mistake. For some reason I was assuming it was returning a non-zero for success, but that's not, uh, that is not correct. All right. So sub token index is six, and then I've got to refresh my memory here on how sub token index works. You just add it, okay? 
<clears throat> and the reason that I did that, I remember, was because I didn't want to just modify the index and not have any way of bringing it back to the parent object token in the list of tokens. So that's all fine. I just, like with so many of these things, was I'm, I'm getting back into this part of it and uh, didn't remember exactly how it worked. Let's start. All right. So now this is the beginning of the array of objects. And we have our GID that it is getting, which obviously maps to five. Now the, oops, these values are mapped to the GIDs as well. Uh, so let's see, so for our array, get token array elements by uh, byte. So that's populating this with just the raw data. So this is actually going to, hmm. So this is actually gonna be a, well, I don't know that that's gonna be a problem. I was gonna say it was gonna be a problem because it's in, it's interspersing the tile set of the enemy with the tile set of the background, but maybe that's not a problem. Let me try and think about why it would have been a problem. It would have been a problem. Well, I guess it would have been a problem if we weren't renormalizing re the data sets um, or the, sorry, the meta tile indexes. I think that'll be okay. All right, so we have our object, we have it that it's an array of objects. So now now this is the sort of tricky part. So we want to Basically, what we need to do is we need to figure out how we're going to represent the data for the enemies in a way that we can track um, when we should spawn them on the map. And we have these Y values, which is where the enemy is positioned on the map. And one possible way that we could handle this is we could say um, look at the y value of the enemy in a list and if the y value matches then spawn the enemy at that point but the problem with that is that that is a list that will the more enemies you have, the more entities you then have to check. And so you're constantly looping through the list of the enemy spawn points. And uh, you're looping through the list of enemy spawn points and respawning them or, or or checking them over and over again and there are things that we could do to reduce the code so that like once the enemy is spawned we remove it from the spawn list but the point is that we don't want it to be I don't want it to be something where it is I don't want the performance to be impacted by the number of enemies on the level 
right? So we don't, if we, if we just loop through this and say, is the camera position at this position? Yes, then spawn the thing, otherwise don't, right? We, we don't wanna do that because then, depending on how many things are in this layer, we're looping through n number of things. And while that n number of things is a, um, is a constant, um, realistically, what we wanna be doing is we wanna be intelligently determining We want to be intelligently determining when things should be spawned. I guess the problem though is that we've gone with this object layer, which isn't tied directly to the tile layer. Now we could well, we don't want to do that. We don't want to place that on the tile layer because then, well, we do. I mean, we sort of do, right? Like we want, on the one hand, the benefit of aligning it with the meta tiles is that we have the ability to look at the map and say, okay, we um, were in this row, so spawn this enemy. But the downside to that is then you're very rigidly confined to where you can place enemies, and I wanted them to be placed in a freeform manner on the map. So, I mean, we could compromise, right? We could say, we could compromise and say that the only time we will spawn an enemy is when we load a layer, or load a row of a meta tile. And that constrains us a little bit in that we have to be within the eight by eight grid but it's not as constraining as 32 by 32. Is there a way to... I was just wondering if there was a way to... Um... This is the layer offset that it's referring to, yeah. I was wondering if there was a way to make it so that the um, the layer had some sort of uh, snap to a grid. So when we place these, we'll see exactly where they're supposed to play, be placed. We can do a real quick search before we um, before uh, we just worry about that later. Um, let's see, snap to grid temporarily control. Is that actually, oops, that's not what I wanted. That snaps to the 32 by 32 grid. I mean, that's technically not awful because again, that's, well, it's still not as fluid as I wanted it to be. I don't know. Am I am I am I prematurely optimizing this by trying to optimize out what amounts to a few hundred, you know, at worst comparisons? Like if we have a situation where we have, let's say, worst case scenario, we have. hundred enemies on the the level we are potentially comparing the camera position against those hundred enemies at the beginning every frame 
you're doing the it's it's actually more than one comparison because we're using the 16 bit value so it's um <clears throat> it would be you know a couple different comparisons or operations per per enemy position and then what we could do is we could obviously do something where if we hit a point where we are seeing an enemy position that is greater than the current camera position we can assume that it was already spawned and if we have the enemies sorted by y uh, coordinate then we can stop and so the list of enemies that we are checking or the spawn points that we're checking will over time decrease as we move through the level. I guess the question is whether or not the NES is going to be able to handle that. Well, you know what, let's implement it that way for now just to get that working and then we can do some uh, stress tests where we add a bunch of enemies um, and I, I can even do it without doing the Y sorting, um, just kind of naively do some checks and then see how that behaves with, you know, right now it's just seven spawn points. If, if it doesn't work with seven spawn points, we know, we know there's no point in continuing. We can then add, you know, f we can do 14 and then 21 and then we just keep adding more and more until we see that it's breaking things and start doing... Well, so at that point, if we see that it's br slowing it down too much, depending on the number of um, enemy spawn, spawn points we're putting in, it might be that we want to... We may need to choose a different approach because it's not enough. Or we might decide... Yeah, or we might decide that it's fine and we can just stay under that number of enemies I don't know we'll let's let's just try that that's a simple approach and and we can get that coded in pretty quickly and then <clears throat> and then um, we'll do right now we'll just do it with the assumption since we only have the flyby enemy type let's do that with the assumption that that is the only enemy type so that we can get that into the NES code here and then from there, we can um, from there we can um, start, you know, making it a little bit more uh, complex and handle things like uh, other enemies and uh, test the performance, etc. All right, so this is our load map code. Um, so in the map. Basically what we need to do now is in the map, let's see, we have our map buffer, the map meta tiles, max meta, blah, 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 blah. Okay, so what we need to do is we need to also have an array of enemy spawn points, I think. So let's do a couple of things here. Let's look back at how we're writing this map data out. At this point, I think we're just writing, if I remember right, the um, the, the full buffer. In one shot, yeah. So we're, the map buffer is just written directly out. And then... I think what I'll do is I'll do the same thing. I'll write out a um, an enemy, essentially an enemy um, binary buffer. Um, in the do I want to do that in the map data? I'm going to do that in a separate file just so it's less code on the NES side to. Uh, to handle that, we just literally will we'll just have a, uh, a label that refers to that. So let's let's do that here. Uh, let's see. So where is it? it? Loaded the map there. 
So let's create the file. Or let's 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 call it something different. Let's call it le level one uh, objects. If uh, that file is greater than or equal to zero. <clears throat> We've got that. We've loaded the map. So now the map needs to also include a vector uh, or an array of an array of uh, or pass back an array of the uh, enemies enemy spawn points, which there won't be too many of them. Like I said, for now, we're just going to make an assumption about the fact that they're, um, they're all the same kind, same kind of enemy. Um, so let's, uh, map objects and, uh, map buffer. The map buffer, I believe, is in main. Yeah, so uh, this would be a vector two byte uh, map objects. Let's just say there's, you know, we're not going to get more than 200 of those. Um,. I guess we need to know how many of them there are, though. Um, so we'll say something like map object count. And um, what is map max size? Let's say map max object size. And say a hundred, that's fine. So load map, <clears throat> load map. Uh, oh, I didn't realize I had. All right, so uh, what is this vector to be? Um, map objects into max map objects and then uh, map object count all right so from this point we have to populate our uh, and Y, right? Um, but let's just do this map. Um, just make that return, set it to zero. Uh, too few arguments, yep. So this should be map, map uh, objects, object, map, max, object size and then map object count because we need to know how many of them there are so we have those and then this needs to be updated all right so we load that and then here we are going to, uh, this is using j, so for uh, int j is less than equals zero, j is less than map object count j. So obviously this is gonna be zero, just let's make sure that 
that's actually the case. And when we export, it uh, creates the file. So that's good. Okay. And then we have our, let's see, level object. Okay, great. So now, we want to do a couple things, right? So first we want to um, want to write how many objects we're actually talking about. And um, and then we want to write those objects. So now we actually have to load those objects. All right. So it's an array of these objects here. So we have our array. Now in the case of this, there wasn't an array of objects. It was just an array. All right, so let's, let's do this. Um, get uh, object count or well, yeah, that's going to be our max, uh, our map object count. Um, so object count will be token, sub token. Oh, this should be. This should be this. About size. Right. And then what we want to do is we want to actually go into the array and for each one of these, get the X and Y and then advance to the next thing. So for, and what are we at in here? We have, Oh, I guess we were using M because this was originally part of the other, part of the main loop. So we can actually use I here. I is equal to zero. I is less than object count plus plus I. Um, all right, so. Let's increment the token index to the first object. And then what we want to do is we want to get the property value as int. So this is JS code, tokens, token index, and tokens minus token index. And the value we want is X. And we want it as an integer, that's fine. Uh, we are going to get that as um, map object i x, except that that is an integer. So let's we're gonna make another one. Get it as byte. Because it matters. All right, so. As byte, um, this should be eight. So let's see. So if it's eight to i, let's just do a cast here. We'll say you had 
eight. Just so it's consistent with our types that we're trying to do here. You win eight pointers. Right, yeah, I know. Um, well, actually, wait a minute. This should be, oh yeah, because I didn't. All right, so that's that. Um, map buffer size equals zero, return false. All right, so that gets our X, um, and then that gets our Y. So that's that object, and then we're going to say advance token index, and that's our tokens and token index. we'll have to step through this just to make sure that this is all looking right but this is going to say okay so now with this object now step through to this next object and we're just going to keep doing that for the number of object count and then we're good so let's let's uh let's make sure that that's actually true So if I load the map, all right, so we have the array. We have seven objects, right? That's what we have on the map. Two, four, six, seven. Okay, great. So now we're on to the first object. We're going to get the X value, which is 43. Let's look at the JSON. 43 and then 2772. Oh crap. Uh yeah. Right. They can't be vector B because they have to be integers for at least the Y value. Right, because right now they're bytes and we have the values that are greater than 256 for the vector. Um, all right, so what we're going to do so this is going to be an actual vector 2. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Sorry. So this should be using an int instead of a byte. Now what? Can I convert argument five from int 16 pointer to int? So we'll load up our map. Let's take a look at the map object. Oops, I guess I had caps lock turned on. Map uh, object I. Yes, 43 and 2772. 206 and 2774. Where are you? Okay. 79 and 2760. 171 and 2760. Alright, so that's all looking good to me. So if we step out. Let's export. Um, well, let's go to the actual export process now. So now this is going to loop through. It's going to have the appropriate map object count. Now what we're going to do is we're going to 
we're going to cheat a little bit. We know that the vector that's being used for map, the map objects is two 16-bit values, but we also know that our x value is always going to be between 0 and 255 um, because the x value, the x world value is only one screen width, so we don't have to worry about the constraint of the byte. It's the y coordinate that can be much higher. So we're going to write one byte for the, well, is it going to be, well, we'll worry about that later. We'll write one byte for the x value, and then we will write two bytes for the, um, for the y value. So uh, system hooks write map file. Now, this may be a problem down the road because um, of byte alignment. Um, performance related issues potentially I don't know how the NES handles that or if it even cares about it um, but we will see so uh, yeah so there's that and then there's Y which will be two bytes think about how this is gonna get stored in memory the lower byte should be first that should be okay we will we will look at the exported data in Fred, the hex editor, um, and make sure that it is actually writing appropriate data. So there's that. So we have uh, seven. Right, so seven objects, and then we have 43 and 2772 and 206 and 2774 and 10 and uh, no. One two seventy nine. Oh, that's signed. Uh, no, that's unsigned. Well, that shouldn't matter. Wait a minute. What is that value supposed to be? Ten or did I not increment? Oh, I didn't increment enough. Um, so that's seventy nine, and then twenty seven sixty, and then one seventy one. That is all looking consistent. Okay. So now after that's done. So we're not actually generating anything in the asset tool to import the level code, which is fine. Let us, what is this? Let us grab the content, the, uh, the level object content. Okay, that built. So let's do this. Let's create a variable for the number of level objects, and then we'll do that in load level. Um, <clears throat> let's start here. Let's say. Load a level one object and then store a and level objects. I think that's what I called it. Let's call it level object count because I feel like uh, it's not clear enough. Um, okay, so that's our level object count. Level one. OK, 
Okay, so that should be getting us our number of objects that we need to check against. And then what I want to do is just have that data be easily accessible level object data reserve two bytes for the address. Um, uh, how do I do that? Load A. Is it just this? Is it level one OBJ and then store? You know, I might be doing it wrong here. Store A level object data and then anybody watching out there is uh, seeing this and going, no, 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 then let me know. Uh, yeah, it doesn't like that. I think this should actually be, I think this should be this, and then this would be that, if I'm remembering right. Let's see what Messin loads up from that code. Bugger. Load. Oh, I'm going to bring up the code view load level. Uh, hit a breakpoint there and go back and press start so it actually loads the level. All right, so load x0, load a. It says 7, so the object count is now 7. That's good. Load a. No, so that actually loaded seven back in. Uh, all right, so, and then 2B is the first, I think that's the first X, that's the X coordinate. Uh, y, Can I do that? I don't remember. I know there's a way to tell suspicious address expression. I know there's a way to do it, and I don't remember what it is anymore because I did that, you know, like 20 streams ago. Um, is it low byte? Uh, high, high byte? Address on the ROM of the thing. Pair X total entities. Load a tile screen X. So that's getting the address there, but I want the actual um, 65. Where's CC65 reference? Uh, oh, I have a Chrome window here already. CC65. Uh, I'm getting started. <clears throat> no. Where's the documentation? There it is. Um, all right. Not what I'm looking for. Where is sixty-five? Um, was it low bytes? 
I want to say it's something like low bite, high bite, but I don't, I don't remember. Dot low bite returns the low bite of its argument. So dot low bite. Do that. Suspicious address expression. What does Messen say when I actually look at that code? What is it actually doing? Uh, it is loading nothing. Okay. <clears throat> Bank byte. This function returns a bank byte that is bits 16 to 23 of the arguments were identical to the caret operator. <coughs> Excuse me. Is this. Two fifty one. So it doesn't care about so this two forty nine is okay. <clears throat> Function returns the bank byte sixteen to twenty three. Doesn't seem like that's what I want. I know what I've. Uh, I know I did for the um, for the other files. We have uh, where is it? No. 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 There's a. Um, Where the heck is it? There is a thing where we're creating a table. And then we have high byte of that and low byte. I guess that's what I need to do. I didn't want to do that, but okay. Um, oh yeah, I guess that's what I'm doing for the map, for the map high and low, which I do need. All right, so uh, maps, uh, we'll call this level one. OBJ. Um, no. Um, call it uh, OBJ's high high bytes. Open included file. F oh yeah, because that was I, I copied over some of the content after it was uh, exporting it with the wrong names. So let's uh, let's fix that. All the way down to the JSON file. Place. Oh, was it OBJ's? Yeah. Okay. So 
So now that should be actually loading what I want it to load. Yep. So that's got the location now for the data. It was, uh, let's see, it was F3 and AB. So go to F3 AB. Yep, there's the data and then we can increment level object data by one because we know the first byte has the um, the number of objects. We already have that loaded into memory. We don't have to we don't have to do that again. We don't have to look at that again and continually offset by that. So, all right, uh, process. Uh, let's see, scroll. Clear entities. So let's see, when we have B pressed, we, or one of the buttons pressed, um, yeah, B pressed, it spawns a flyby. So we have this add flyby here. Why is this a loop? Total entities. Oh, because it's looking for. Okay, so it's looking for a location in the entities list that is appropriate for um, placing the um, the entity in. So let's do this. Let uh, let's get rid of the code to add the flyby because we don't want to do that anymore. We're just going to skip to the button A check because we don't care about button B anymore for now. I don't want to get rid of, well, yeah, let's, uh, I don't want to get rid of this code. We can leave it. Let's just jump to check A. And let me let me add something here. If we want to do something for B, then change this jump. All right, so we have that. And realistically, this add flyby Can make it a subroutine technically. Even though these are technically slow, we can we can deal with that for now. So all right. Um So let's uh, let's process this level stuff. All right. So we are going to load the Y position of the camera. We're going to decrement it, and then we're going to check the carry. And then once that's done, before we deal with the meta tiles, let's process the enemy spawn points, okay? So um, load x with zero. Um, compare that with, compare x with, uh, what is it? It's called uh, level object count branch if equal to this. No, actually, uh, we'll call it uh, done with objects 
done with objects. Okay. Uh, otherwise, jump um, back to uh, check objects. Uh, this should be CPX. This should be check objects. Okay. Um, so, uh, and then increment level. Uh, no, increment X. All right. So, uh, load A. Uh, level object data. Well, it shouldn't actually be one, a uh, zero, it should be one because we want to check the Y position, not the X position. We don't care about the X position. Um, so load this. That actually changes that compare, but we'll, we'll fix that in a second. Um, because let's see, for every, every, Every one of these we want to increment by three. So it'd be one and then four. So the level object count is actually, uh, um, let's, let's get rid, let's deal with the, the, the function here first before I fix this comparison. We could even, you know what, we could even just do this. Load Y, compare Y, um, and then increment, increment Y once. Really just trying to make this happen tonight here. Um, all right, so we load that, and then we compare that to uh, camera plus camera, oops, camera, Y position. Um, and if this is not equal to um, done with, no, um, to uh, no um, skip object spawn, skip object spawn. Okay, and then we want to load level object data x. Uh, this actually should be one less increment here because we need to do that here and then we want to compare that to camera camera y, plus, y position plus one branch not equal to skip object spawn and if they are both equal then we will um, jump subroutine add flyby and then we're done here. So we go, we want to skip the first X byte, right? So we, let's see, so that's, we're at the first Y byte, we compare it, we go to the next Y byte, we compare it, we go to the next, that gives us to the next X. Okay, we do need to do that twice, then we increment Y, Y is our normal counter that we're comparing against the level object count. And if we reach that, we are done with the objects. And okay, so obviously this is not the most efficient way of doing this, but like I said, we don't really care right now. We just wanna see how this goes. Um, jump RTS is not the appropriate way to do that. It's just RTS, right? Uh, yeah, return subroutine. Okay. Uh, what is the problem? Warning. Error. Uh, jump out of range. Damn it. Uh, 1809. Branch equal finish controls. Um, so, um, branch not equal to the next label. Otherwise, jump to that. And this is the next label. Okay. Ah, uh, these branch out of range things are annoying. Um, all right. So add flyby. Oh, yeah, no, that shouldn't be doing that. That's even, that's, yeah, no, that's bad. Um, this should be RTS. Range should be equal to add flyby entity, add flyby loop. Okay, my mistake. All right, let's see how badly we've broken this.
So do we mess up something in the alignment of the... <sighs> we did. Uh, why? Oh, because it added that. It added that. It added it because it thinks it's part of the tile set, which it technically is, except that it's it's not. All right, let me, for the sake of doing this, getting this wrapped up, let's put in this horrible hack where we say, if you see the meta tile set called flyby, ignore it. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Some map meta tiles. Uh, this is the source. So let's see. So if string compare. Map meta tiles m name equals uh, no, uh, flyby dot png meaning that if it's not that we're gonna go into this loop here or into this part of the code and I need to close that paren. count um, let's do this let's then say this should be this like that and we say else meta tile count minus minus That's not gonna work. Uh, that's also really gross. Let's get rid of that. Sorry. Um, yeah, that's that's just really bad. Really bad. Okay. Let's go back to our stuff here and let's see if we can figure out a way. The only way we would know is if we looked at the object layer and saw that that meta tile is used in the object layer, which meant we wouldn't want to include it. I'm going to cheat. Again, because right now I just want to, I want to get this to work. So we get the enemy spawning, and then we will go back and clean up this uh, sort of horrible approach. Um, all right, so all the regenerated files are here. Now the good news is it looks like having the loop for the check is not uh, breaking the bank in terms of uh, the way that things are scrolling. It's still, uh, I'm still pretty convinced that it's not good. Um, but okay, so let's take a look at the way that this is doing this comparison, let's restart and uh, see. All right, so 
x and y are 1 and 0 respectively. We're going to compare y with the level object count, which is 7. Um, we're going to branch of equal to done with objects. Otherwise, we're going to load the first value for the first, the first part of the y value, which is f3. And we're going to compare it against the camera y position, which is, uh, let's see. That's the, that's the, <clears throat> should just be plus one, and 69. It's not equal. All right, so I guess the first question. Um, let's see, camera is at 68. Go to 68. So let's see, so 9F. That's the exposition of 150. No, really? Uh, I guess that's just B9F, B9F. Yes, okay, so it's just a Y position. Um, all right, so 9F, 0B. Now in the hex editor, let's take a look at Take a look at the uh, level one object information. Oh, you know, well, I, I just realized something, but let's let's just make sure that I didn't do something even more dumb in a second. But uh, let's see. Yeah, so that that's okay. I think the pro I think I know what the problem is. I I just realized that we're calling the spawn, but we're not actually telling it what coordinates to uh, spawn on, which, uh, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't work. Um, we don't want to load it based on the, well, it would do it based on, hmm. So it would do it based on the player's current position, which is how it had been doing it. So it should, should at least show it should at least show something let's uh, it should at least show the sprite appearing uh, let's um, add flyby oh this is a problem uh, transfer X, transfer X to A, push A. Uh, do we use Y here? No, okay. Um, pull A, transfer A to X. So the, the problem is that we're using A and X, uh, sorry, X and Y in our loop for calculating when we should add the thing to the entity memory and then we are clobbering it um, in calling add flyby. So let's reload this. Add flyby colon. Okay. So do we ever get to a point where it actually calls that? No. Uh, all right. So the next question is, did I just reverse? My bytes. Uh, 
just a simple thing to just check and uh, oh fancy all right <clears throat> Okay, so calling the subroutine is apparently causing the problem. Let's see. Transfer x to a, push a, load x zero. Oh, wait. What? Why were you doing that? Um, uh, compare x. Um, oops, okay. So branch not equal to this next label, otherwise return. Okay. That was just a uh, weird translation error. Moving it to be a separate subroutine. Let's see if that fixes the problem. Oh yeah, it does. Okay, so so now the flyby is going to spawn wherever the player is. So that's the first part. We'll see some flybys coming into the frame. Now that's weird. Okay, so it's it's spawning them, but the rate seems to be wrong. All right, well, at least it's sort of spawning them, so that's cool. Hey, Zurchenheimer, uh, it goes. I'm spending a lot of time kind of trying to just get this wrapped up for tonight. I've been working on it for about uh, almost two and a half hours, so let's see if we can make this work. Um, the other problem is the camera is what? The camera, I think I'm doing a, I think we're moving by two. No, I'm actually only moving by one. Pause game, gameplay state. Subtract one from the camera. Decrement scroll. All right, so we're only moving by one, so that's good. Um, I thought for some reason maybe we were doing by two pixels. All right, so load A, camera Y position. So that's the other thing. It looked like I had reversed the byte positions in the file or something causing that problem. So we do our camera math and then we look at the checks here for the objects. Then we call jump subroutine add flyby. The thing is, though, that it should, they should all kind of be popping in at around the same point because they're all kind of clustered together here. Um, let's do this, though. Let's actually get the X position out of here so that we can, uh, we can call the add flyby and have it properly update the X position so that it, it's placed where it's supposed to be. Um, maybe, maybe it's working, but just based on the sort of weird way it's handling it, it's not, um, we don't know it because we're not seeing all of the entities that are spawned. So, uh, let's do this. So we compare and the branch to equal, we're done. Load a, that store a and temp, and then increment X, and then we'll do that again. So, um, this is the X position for, um, the new flyby if we need it. Okay, so now if we call JSR add flyby, 
instead of getting the X position of the player, we're going to load A with temp. And then that will be our new X position. And the Y position will be at the top of the screen like it's supposed to be. Let's see if that makes it work. Unreverse the bytes. All right, what does temp have here? <sighs> temp is address seven C, and the value is eight, which it seems well, maybe that's right. No, no, that's not, none of them are at that position. So, uh, let's see, where would eight be? Where is there a value of eight? Anywhere? Here. So compare that load a level object data X. Um, so that is our X position. Then we're going to sort in temp. Then we're going to go to the next position. This is the first byte of the Y position. I guess it's supposed to be like this now. I don't remember. Um, yeah, it would be this and then it would be that, right? Because if I look at the memory map, I'll restart and look at the memory map here. Right, mem. Where's the camera? The camera is sixty-eight. <clears throat> Zero A. Yeah. Okay. So it's it's low byte, high byte, which that's how I have it in the file. Data is at four three D D four or F three D four F three D four F three D four F three D four. So the first value is X two B and then it's D four zero A. So let's take a look. All 
All right, so I know this isn't going to match, but I should be seeing first my x value. is x giving me d4 or why I mean why is what does a have that that's off by one byte um, level object data why is your byte wrong This is the low byte, which is D3. And then that's the high byte, which is F3. So F3, D3. F3, D3. That's that. All right. And then F3, D4 is that. So F3, D4, that's OK. Oh, right. Oh. Um, because no, no, that doesn't make any sense. I was going to say I was starting at index one, but no, we changed that. So check objects. That shouldn't x should be zero coming into here. So. the bytes. All right, so x is 0, y is 0, level object count is 7. So we compare okay, level object data is f3d4, f3d4 is 2b. So load that. Uh, why is it giving me this? Load a level object data, comma x. Uh, is it because I'm using the comma x? But that's weird because it's offset. Unless it's, is it just some weird coincidence that it's happening? So is it looking at, let's, no, because that would be indirect addressing. Um, <clears throat> F3, level object data is F3D4. So F3D4, which with X0, What gives? It should be 2b. Shouldn't it? And not d4, which is the next byte. And then we increment x, and then we're going to load f3. Level object data x. That's not even, that's not even right. So, oh, <sighs> sorry. 
sorry. Just kidding. So I don't I don't know what possessed me to um, think I could do it that way, but um, let's see, load A. So we need to do the indirect addressing. Um, so we want the address that level object data represents with Y as the offset and X is our normal counter. So let's see, so this also should be Y here. So we load our X position, we store it, we increment Y, we load the first Y position um, that's the low byte, and then we get the next one, and that's the high byte, and then we branch if not equal, otherwise we sub go to the subroutine, and then we're done. So we don't want to do this, we want to do... Hmm just a problem with the way that this is um, branch of let's do this branch of equal to this next label um, we do this jump and then we'll do this and the reason we're doing this is because in this case um, we need to increment y twice to get to the x value um, here we increment it once and then if it's equal, then we will jump to the next same thing. Um, otherwise, we want to increment y again and um, then jump to skip object spawn. Otherwise, we are going to do a JSR to the add flyby. Here, we're just incrementing the x. Okay, I think that I think that buttoned it up. Let's see. Get out. Uh, well, let's just make sure. Compare x to level object count. Branch of equal load a to b. Uh, f three. Let's see. Where's that? Where's level object? F three d b. F three. F three d b. Two b. Okay. That's our x value, and then increment y, and load the first part, that's d4, and then, okay, great. The ship exploded, okay, there are our enemies, and they spawned in the appropriate order. Now the positioning is wrong because the speed at which the screen traverses, uh, this, okay, the yeah, so it's it's not the speed of the traversal, it's the speed of which they move. The spawn position is correct, but because they're not moving at a speed that's um, the same as the um, screen scroll, then uh, as a result, what happens is they, where is this process player? I want to process the, oh, because the flybys are moving at a slower rate than the screen is scrolling, they are kind of bunching up and not maintaining that formation. Um, let's see, where the hell is the process code for the entities? Initialize this. Uh, we don't need to do this sprite explosion anymore because it was just for fun. Uh, okay, check left, check right, add bullet, process entities. Okay, so process flyby, jump to process flyby. Uh, let's see, we're comparing uh, increment load A to 
data compare to three. So we do a counter where we are incrementing the y position um, every three frames. Let's just, we'll just increment the y position. What's the matter? Oh, yeah, this is not C or C++. Try again. All right, let's uh, try that again. Now they're going to move a lot faster, but they should maintain that formation now, and they do. Okay, cool. And you can't spawn them anymore. Okay, so now... In theory, we could, you know, add them like this and like that, and uh, I don't know, and some over here, right? And then we export. And then the only thing that we have to do that's different um, from before because of the problem related to the fact that it added the um, this to the list is I'm going to manually remove this right now. All right, and then the uh, asset tool. We'll just export. Hopefully this actually works. I don't need the JSON file. All right, uh, where's shooters folder? Copy, paste, replace. Let's rebuild this. Not that, this. Okay, that's rebuilt. Let's go back to Messin and restart. And let's see if we get a bunch more enemies spawning. So there are the initial ones. Okay, so that's essentially doing what it's supposed to. Um, there was a weird glitch in there and I, I don't know. It seems like that may have been because of too many Things being checked with the um, with the enemies and the bullets. Oh, I died. Oh, I can still shoot when I die. Cool. It's a good way to crash the game. Um, all right. Well, obviously, obviously, I should check the. Uh, I should stop allowing the player to shoot if he crashes or if she crashes. Um, Kind of glitches out when you have too many bullets. We gotta see if we're just gonna limit the number or optimize the code so that it's not a problem anymore. But yeah, so it's spawning enemies now on the map, um, as you would expect. Um, so that's cool. So obviously it's super limited in the way that it's doing it um, because it's assuming that any object on the object layer is that flyby. Um, I have to manually modify the map to properly handle the uh, to proper to to properly handle the fact that we've added that tile set for the flyby um, for the object layer. So I've got to do some work there where it removes anything that isn't a background tile set, essentially. Um, and then, um, we got to start looking at how to make it actually spawn something other than a hard coded, uh, enemy type, which means we should probably have some other enemy types. Um, but that's basically the functionality there. Um, like I said, there's probably the, the glitching out of the, um, the glitching out of the tiles in the background likely do, is due to performance with too many things happening on screen and with the processing of the enemy um, 
the enemy object loop in the map every frame uh, we really need to um, we we really have to sort those objects by the y value and at least at the very least and um, not check the ones that are past the current y value so that we can narrow down the list again that's at the least there's probably some better stuff we can do to be a little bit smarter about how we're how we're handling um thanks windows um let's reschedule that we don't need to be doing that um right this second so let's make that later thanks um so what was i saying yeah so we probably need to be smart about how we handle all of that but the point is we got it working we got it spawning the enemies and um and uh now we need new enemies that we can spawn and um you know that's cool though we're, we're getting there um and we're able to do it in tiled uh which makes it pretty easy to work with um gotta go refactor some of this nes asset tool code but uh, i think that's it for now as always thank you for watching i appreciate it i appreciate all the comments that people have been posting on youtube um you know questions that you've had about how i'm doing this and how any s uh programming works um as always if you have more questions you can find me on twitter at clarvis you can post to the uh comments section of the recording that i'll post on youtube after uh the stream is done and i'm on nintendo age um as uh, uh, Zelius um, uh, in the Discord, and you can, or Clarvis in the Discord, you can find you can find me there, uh, along with a bunch of other people who are more experienced than I am uh, with NES programming. But um, you know, it's a great community. Uh, Nestev too, although they tend to be more sort of uh, particular and and technical minded. So you might be better off with Nintendo Age. It's a little a little bit friendlier. Um, for the most part uh, although that's just hearsay i haven't had any issue in either um context so um but anyway um we'll uh, pick up our streaming monday 9 p.m eastern and uh yeah thanks for watching and see you see you monday have a great weekend take care